I don't, I suppose, regard myself as a free speech absolutist. I don't hope that doesn't make me a heretic uh, in this room. I believe strongly in freedom of expression, including the right to offend. Uh, obviously, I have deep concerns and will be expressing them through amendments as soon as the hate speech legislation comes back at committee stage in the Shannon. I think it's profoundly dangerous for freedom of expression, the development of ideas in our society. Very worried as well about how it will feed into European legislation and used as a kind of an Esham law or our example as to how freedom can be restricted in this area um, but I do believe for example that the Media Commission and uh, the Digital Services Act can do good I am strong on restricting porn so I'm certainly not a freedom of expression uh, person in that area I think it does profound damage in our society so um, if you regard that as a form of expression I ain't uh, the friend of that but, but on the question of expressing our ideas about the way things should be that's where I plant my own personal flag, as I know many of you do too. There are rules that govern humanity. Uh, the Titan submarine tragedy revealed that fundamental physical laws cannot be trifled with. A submarine is as strong as its weakest seal, as we all know. There are also laws inbuilt in our nature which require utmost respect. One of these is freedom of expression. This relates to our ability to reflect, to think, and to share those reflections with others. And because I have a duty to share the planet with you, to live peaceably with you, I have a responsibility to discourse with you. And I have a right to freedom of speech in order to exercise that responsibility. If I cannot communicate with you, we cannot have a shared way forward. So it is a fundamental freedom. And without that freedom, there is no sharing of space. There is no genuine peace. There is instead dominion of one over the other. That you might dislike my views or be hurt by them, that's important, but it's not fundamental. There is no comparison between the fundamental right of freedom of expression based on duties and one's claim, on the other hand, as opposed to a right, the claim not to be hurt uh, by what somebody else says. These are on a different level. And if we allow a claim not to be hurt as the measure of freedom of speech, then we give one side a weapon to use against the other, limiting the free exchange of ideas very conveniently. This duty to live peaceably indicates that I cannot just say anything that comes into my head without there being consequences. Insulting each other will upset communications. So we've agreed restrictions on what can be said or not said. The Rabat principles speak of different levels of hate speech. There is a sea of difference between speech which deliberately provokes violence and some expressing an intense dislike for another person. May I say, by way of an aside, that I know the photographer has to do her job, but I always found, find it dis profoundly disturbing because it's very, very difficult for me to produce the kind of face that looks well in a photograph. But don't let me stop you from doing what you have to do. But normally I like to be able to prepare and have three seconds, you know, still before you do it. Anyway, as long as the spittle, I suppose, doesn't appear in the photograph, I should be happy. Anyway, if, sorry about that. If I cannot communicate ideas freely to others, um, um, due to, sorry, if I cannot communicate ideas freely due to others uh, asserting a silencing power over me, then there cannot be a free participative democracy. Freedom of expression is fundamental to democracy. It's baked into its definition. And it's a freedom that I have by virtue of who I am, and it's not one to be surrendered at a whim. Free communication of ideas may sometimes cause hurt, as I've said. People are not all equally robust. Shouting at each other is often part of the way we make progress, though. And I say that as a person who believes in the Christian ideal of being kind and not doing hurt unnecessarily, needless to say. And I'm a great believer in tact, even though I don't always live it out. But shouting at each other, though, as I said, is often a part of the way we make progress, whether or not that shouting is amplified by social media. And there's a difference between shouting and abuse. But we cannot risk the dismantling of a fundamental freedom in the name of the supposed vulnerability of some without analysing where that will lead. We all know it is a tactic of progressive politics, be it right or left, to seek to silence opposing voices. Communism did that effectively. Modern woke communism seeks also to wield similar power, to deplatform the oppressor. This allows progressive ideas, including nonsensical ones, and we could have a long list of those tonight, all of which are kind of being canvassed wholesale in our society at the moment, but those sometimes nonsensical progressive ideas go unchallenged out of the fear of the challenger of being censored or deplatformed. 
Modern mainstream media, of course, has joined the censorship brigade for the most part for a variety of reasons, but mainly because proper political discourse is happening on social media outside of their control. Anything that breaks the power of social media can only be good for the agenda of some mainstream legacy media. Western administrative democracy also prefers censorship. Global politics is enormously complex. It's easier to administer a society in which certain discourses are shut down, whether it be cultural elites in the UN or pretend Democrats in the EU or globalist do-gooders in the WHO. The story is the same. Power must be left in the hands of those in charge and free speech is seen as an unwelcome obstacle very often. The experience of COVID, the vaccines and the lockdowns has been instructive. We don't know the full story, but it's relatively clear now to those who have followed the story closely that the vaccines should never have been mandated, that masking and social distancing were ineffective, and that lockdowns were an economic disaster. There are also emerging frightening stories of ongoing vaccine damage, which may or may not prove true. In any, and I have no desire, nor has anyone here, I'm sure, to make any case that isn't, in the end, approvable. We all want an evidence base for what we're asserting and claiming. But in any event, what we have had across all of social media, media and legacy media was a top-down, agreed and very effective silencing of the troublesome sceptics, some, uh, some of whose viewpoints are proving remarkably true now, I think. The science that we were called to trust was univocal, because dissenting scientists were silenced. Truth requires the oxygen of free expression, however. Without that, all you have is propaganda. Our hate speech bill buys into that silencing of troublesome types who might not agree with government or with those who make the rules around gender in particular, but also around other issues. Given the draconian nature of that bill, one might be forgiven for thinking that Irish society was lawless in this area, dripping with hate, but not so. In 2022, despite an extensive campaign to promote awareness of hate crime, Gardaí, using a very expansive definition of hate, as you remember it depends on a person's perception of what is said, uh, but even at that expansive uh, definition, they recorded 72 non-crime hate incidents, precisely the sort of incident to be captured by the hate speech element of the bill. Now that figure should be compared with the 57,000 thefts and the 22 thousand assaults in the same year. Recent mismanagement of the international protection system has certainly elevated the debate on illegal migration and may promote tensions within our society. But telling people that they are promoting hate without any clear definition and using draconian punishments to silence them will only add to such tensions in my view. It will also lead to the suppression of truth and to the ongoing mismanagement uh, of international protection going unchallenged. There is a lot at stake with the hate speech bill. Given the Irish role in the European digital space, what we decide will become a baseline measurement for hate speech across all social media platforms in Europe. Elon Musk's attempts to provide for genuine political pluralism in social media may count for naught uh, if the bill goes through, perhaps. Government ministers tell people that their intention is not to silence free expression and nobody will end up prison. But prison is the least of some people's worries. The process is the punishment. Step out of line with your gender view, your migration view, your World Health Organization view, and some administrator within the Irish state will have the power to shut your social media megaphone down, set the police on you potentially, and put you through a legal hell, all because an anonymous someone somewhere feels hurt and is motivated to insist that you are breaking the law and that the forces of law and order should push it up to you. I don't know if any of you saw um, there's something a very interesting one going around on social media at the moment and I'm always a bit sceptical when I see stuff at social media but it can't be all um, artificially intelligence produced and uh, I don't know if any of you saw that incident in London where the guy is playing the piano and the two people from China with the Chinese flag obviously representatives of the Chinese administration uh, want him to stop recording and to remove them from the recording uh, even though they're in a public place in Britain but the star of that particular video uh, were, were not these Chinese part, Communist Party apparatchiks. It was the British policewoman who came up and argued their case uh, for them with the, the, the star of the show whose name temporarily escapes me. I think he's an Irishman. Anyway, 
Um, as I've said, prison is the least of it. It's about the process. It's about people censoring themselves because they're not sure if what they say is stepping over a line. It's about the possibility that they will be approached and that they will feel that they are somehow on the margins of civilised society since they're being approached in this way, all having a chilling effect uh, on, on their communication. And that aspect of the process is already punishing. And obviously if it goes further and there's some kind of process, even if they don't end up coming out on the wrong side, uh, they will still have suffered enormously. And if that isn't the case of poor encourage les autres, uh, nothing is. A chilling effect in conclusion on free speech will penetrate many aspects of political and public life, especially in this era of cancel culture. If renowned, high-profile individuals get cancelled or lose their jobs when accused of hate speech, what chance has the ordinary Joe or Josephine of expressing their views on their preferred social media account? Democracy has red lines, and Democrats who do not abide by these do so at their peril. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to spending more time with you and learning from you on a future occasion.